Chapter 10 Rocco crossed his legs so that two teeny weeny trolls gripping opposite ends of a third troll dipped in shoe polish could seesaw across his immense appraised oxford. When they had finished with him, the troll threesome scurried over to me, took one look at my hopelessly scarred steel toe brogans, dismissed me as a lost cause, and went back to general cleanup. Let me get this straight said Rocco, aiming his index fingers at the guts of my theory. You're actually suggesting that I or my brother Dominic attempted to assassinate Roger Rabbit yesterday with a custard cream pie? Is that the gist of your accusation, Mr. Valiant? Do I have that 100% correct? I had to admit it did sound a lot less likely coming from him than it had from the rabbit. Rocco leaned back in his chair. Look at the contents of this office, Mr. Valiant. Look! The original framed comic strips on the walls cost an average of $50,000 each. My desk, a priceless antique. These trolls, $50 a day. My suit, $600 worth of custom tailored linen. I have wealth, status, a successful business. Wine, Mr. Valiant. Why on earth would I jeopardize all that by assaulting a rabbit with a custard cream pie? At least I had that one covered. Roger threatened to kill you during a fight at Carol Masters. Maybe he scared you so badly you decided to get him before he got you. Are you serious? He poked his pork sausage thumbs against his chest. Me? Frightened of a rabbit? He was right, of course, and I knew it. This whole line of questioning gave me a near-terminal case of embarrassment. The only reason I decided to have one last go at Rocco before I bailed out was so there could be no Carol Masters walking around saying I haven't given the rabbit his money's worth. Maybe it sounds far-fetched, but so does a lot of other stuff in this case. For instance, why did you give a contract to the rabbit who stole your girl? Why did Jessica suddenly leave Rabbit and return to you? Rocco went to his bar and poured two scotch and sodas. He collared the nearest troll, upended it, and swizzed it through both glasses. Rocco handed one of the glasses to me, wrung the troll out over the sink, and draped it across the faucet to dry. Another troll trotted up with a butterfly net ready to snare our ear puffs. Lovable rascals, trolls, but a bit short in the smarts department. You wonder why Jessica came back to me? said Rocco, scooting the troll's net away from his head. I suspect she simply grew tired of Roger's eternal lunacy. I provide her with cultured, refined companionship. You can't get that from a rabbit. As to why I gave Roger his contract, also simple. Naturally, I was miffed when Jessica and Roger eloped. Who wouldn't be? But I never let my personal life interfere with business. Maybe Herman needed a stooge? I pegged Roger Rabbit as the perfect choice, the eternal sidekick, a fluffy Gabby Hayes. He waved his arm in a circular gesture, which grew in circumference to encompass the office, the building, the street outside, the entire world. Oh, I've heard the rumors that I signed Roger only to win Jessica back. <laughs> His laughter exposed two rows of teeth remarkable for their resemblance to weather-worn tombstones. I'd like to hear anyone explain how I could expect to regain Jessica by turning her new husband into a big success. I don't think Roger would classify being Fall Guy to Baby Herman as a big success. Rocco clicked up a notch from joviality to mild annoyance. I discussed that with Roger at great length. He does not have the talent to support his own strip, period. He sat down at his priceless antique desk and fondled the labels of his $600 custom tailored suit. Tell you what, even though I've gone over it with him a hundred times before, I'll be glad to meet with Roger and explain it to him yet again. Lately he refuses to come here, so I'll even spare him that. I'll go to his house any day he wants. Just tell him to let me know when and I'll be there. Rocco fluttered his fingers through a bypassing troll daydream, a wispy multicolored affair of abstract content, the kind trendy socialites imbued in the sight and display on entregars. 
As for the incident with the custard cream pie, I thought we can probably categorize that as another of Roger's hallucinations. It was no hallucination. I saw the python myself. Yes, I'm sure you did, said Rocco. He closed his eyes and folded his hands across his chest. Cast him in lead, stick a clock in his stomach, and he would easily have fetched six bits as a novelty Buddha in any El Chipo second-hand store in town. After a few seconds, he came back to life, rummaged through his desk, removed an address book, and copied out a name, which he passed across to me. Do me this one favor. Here's a noted tuned psychiatrist, Dr. Booker T. Beaver. You may have heard of him. The syndicate uses him for public service comics, feedy pamphlets, and family planning brochures the medical associations distribute to the free clinics. Roger goes to him. I think a few words with Dr. Beaver might put this whole pie episode into proper perspective. Do that. Talk to Dr. Beaver. If you still suspect me afterward of having any connection with this bizarre pie-flinging incident, I'd be more than happy to do whatever you want. Even take a lie detector test to convince you of my innocence. Is that a reasonable approach? It certainly was, and I figure I'd better go along with it, since it was probably the only reasonable approach I was likely to encounter in this screwball case. Chapter 11 Roger's psychiatrist agreed to see me after office hours. In person, he presented as imposing a demeanor as a toon beaver could. He moved slowly and with great precision, so that the layer of fat that plumped out of his lower body gave him an air of portly dignity rather than jiggly overindulgence. He kept his broad, flat, oblong tail tucked up and away in a special pocket sewn on the underside of his white jacket, a gimmick that made him resemble a cross between the hunchback of Notre Dame and a ping pong paddle. His head hair, the same slightly muddy brown as a river bottom, was parted down the middle and combed to each side, hiding his stubby ears. He waxed his scraggly nose whiskers and twisted them into a handlebar so curvaceous that, in bad light, he might be mistaken for a Harley Davidson. Yellow-tinted aviator glasses camouflaged his ridiculously bulging button eyes and broke up the solid arch extending from the tip of his nose to the top of his head. To satisfy his cravings for something to gnaw, he kept a number of mahogany wood turnings in an antique umbrella stand beside his desk. A solid silver dustpan and wisp broom took care of the wood chips. His medical diploma, dated 20 years earlier, proclaimed him a graduate of TCU, Toon Christian University. His word balloons resembled the scrawly prescription forms you take to the drugstore. Naturally, he said. Since Roger is a patient, I can't discuss his case clinically, but if he's in trouble of some sort, and I might be able to help, I would be only too happy to oblige. So long as I compromise no professional ethics in the process, of course. He ran his nose the length of a wooden pencil, then devoured it as casually as someone eating a piece of candy. He plucked the eraser discreetly off his lips and dropped it into his wastebasket. What seems to be the problem? He asked with great solemnity. That nearly put the caper on it. How could I conduct a serious interrogation of a psychiatrist who snacked on pencils? I thought about the retainer and pressed forward. My main concern is an incident involving an attack with a custard cream pie. When the beaver leaned back and stroked his severely receding chin, his white coat flapped open to reveal a three-piece dark blue pinstripe suit, expertly tailored to disguise his spreading paunch. Ah yes, I'm quite familiar with it, he said after a short period of contemplation. You are? Most assuredly. Dr. Beaver rolled his front paw across a desktop dispenser containing a giant ball of extra heavy-duty dental floss, a necessity for those prone to munch on mahogany. Let me phrase this as delicately as possible. Roger has undergone a tremendous amount of strain recently. His continued role as a subordinate to baby Herman, his marital problems climaxed by the loss of his wife. 
In my opinion, Roger must be considered a very sick rabbit, fully capable of concocting the most fantastic stories to rationalize his failures in life. There exist a number of quite complex psychological theories which explain such behavior. But to put it in layman's language for you, Roger has become incapable of separating reality from fantasy. One of Roger's most persistent nightmares involves an attack of some faceless aggressor wielding a pie. He's reported to me numerous times, although he normally specifies lemon meringue. But I saw the empty pie tin. I'm sure you did. The beaver tilted his bullet-shaped head forward on his squatty neck and tweaked a straight kink out of his mustache. Most likely, Roger either hired someone to hit him with it, or did the deed himself, and fabricated the attacker. He's done such things before with other of his nightmares, acted them out, that is, at my encouragement, naturally. I considered it quite beneficial to dramatize these deep-seated terrors, to disentangle them from the subconscious, to confront them head-on, to see that they're nowhere near as frightening in actuality as they are when kept locked in the mind. Rogers never acted out the pie episode before, though I've urged him to do so quite often. I have a hunch I'll hear him confess to it at his next session. It would be a major breakthrough. I doodled a few large cuckoo birds in the margin of my notebook. The beaver's comments clinched it. Roger Rabbit was as loony as a bed bug. If my next stop turned out as I expected it to, I could legitimately consider this case closed. The first thing next morning, I brought Roger's pie tin to the pie shop whose name was stamped on the bottom. Sure enough, the pie man remembered selling such a pie to none other than Roger Rabbit. The pie man took 15 cents out of the register and handed it to me. The deposit, he said, for the tin. I gave it to him, took the money, and felt I had earned every last penny.